So now I'd like to welcome Dr. Michael Walsh. Um, Thank you. To give a presentation. He's currently a postdoctoral fellow in the lab of Dr. Rohit Bhargav in the Department right. of Bioengineering here. And today he'll be talking Cheers, about so chemical imaging for histopathology, an emerging group for molecular and structural analysis of tissues. Thank you. Yep, I'm good. Cool, thank you. Cool, uh, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the uh, organizers of this symposium for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak to you all today. It's a real pleasure to be here. Didn't have to come very far, just four floors down. Um, so today I'd like to talk about the emergence of chemical imaging, so a new imaging modality uh, for histopathology with a particular focus on cancer pathology. So if you're interested in looking at tissue, particularly uh, biopsies, uh, and you're interested in looking at uh, molecular and structural analysis, uh, you'll typically go and use a stain. This can be a special stain or an immunohistochemical stain. Uh, this is an example of uh, colon with some work I'm doing with Rex Gaskins. Uh, so what we have is a new imaging modality, or a series of imaging modalities, which we're terming chemical imaging. And this can give us similar information, but in a completely label-free approach. And it's based essentially on the inherent biochemistry of the tissue. So how does this work? So one of these modalities we call, uh, it's called FTIR, or mid-infrared spectroscopy. And the uh, basis of this is that we use mid-infrared light, and different regions of the mid-infrared are absorbed by different chemical bonds. So for example, carbon, uh, carbon oxygen, carbon nitrogen, and these chemical bonds form the base constituents of important cellular biomolecules. So for example, proteins, DNA, lipids, collagen, uh, glycogen. So the principle is we have our mid-infrared, it passes through our tissue, and we get what we have is a, an absorbent spectrum or a biochemical cell fingerprint. Uh, this is part of the uh, spectrum. And essentially these different peaks correspond to different biomolecules. So uh, these are a measure of the chemical bonds. They vibrate in different modes and this will tell you what structure they're in or things like protein conformational changes. And essentially the basis for all I'm going to show today is that this signature, this spectrum, will be altered between different cell types or different disease states or whatever it is you're interested in. Okay, so what is FTIR? Well, it's actually very similar to a visible microscope, and in fact, you can do visible microscopy through this. The difference is we flip a mirror, and instead of visible light, we use mid-infrared light. And instead of using a CCD, we have an infrared-sensitive array detector. So uh, one of the biggest advances in this, and which has really led to this being an emerging technology over the last few years, has been advances in these detectors. They've become much, much bigger, and now we're actually on a scale where we are clinically feasible to image uh, within a few minutes. So what do we get? So we'll end up with an infrared data cube. So you'll put your tissue on, you'll press the imaging button, and then you get this. And this is a data cube, or an infrared data cube. So it's actually very similar to a typical visible image. We have our X and Y, this, there we go, uh, X and Y, this is our spatial dimension, and then we have our Z dimension. So in a visible image, this will typically be red, green, and blue. In our image, we have all this chemical information, so we have all the chemistry. So essentially, every pixel within an image will have the entire spectrum present, so you'll have uh, everything you need. Okay, so we're using this technology primarily towards uh, tissue histopathology. So by this I mean uh, being able to uh, diagnose diseases, particularly uh, with a focus on cancer pathology. So if you suspect of having a cancer, you'll have a biopsy taken, and you'll have uh, typically the first stage will be a H and E stain. Many will be familiar with this. And then alongside this, you may do a series of additional serial sections and additional stains. So these can be special stains, such as Mason's trichrome, or cell type specific stains, such as cytokeratin for epithelial cells, or vimentin for fibroblasts. Uh, and then you may take another series of stains. So for example, in the case of breast cancer, uh, things like ER, PR, and HER2 new. This is a very time consuming, expensive, laborious process, which doesn't always work, um, as any of you who use immunohistochemical stains will be able to attest to. So our goal is to integrate all this information and take it from a single unstained IR image. Uh, so we can basically mine into the chemical information, for example, the collagen, the protein, and use this for classification. And I'll just generally tell you, uh, I won't go into too much detail with the classification, but I'll give you an idea of what it gives you. So the first thing we do is we take our unstained biopsy sample. 
Uh, the important thing here is this is completely compatible with the current clinical workflow in pathology. Uh, I work very closely with uh, Cole Hospital uh, adjacent to here, uh, and especially with the pathology department at the uh, College of Medicine and uh, the Department of Pathology in Chicago. So we take our own state biopsy sample, we'll do our staining, you do immunochemical stains. Alongside this, we'll collect our infrared data cube. Uh, as I said, we work very closely with the pathologist and they'll uh, give us information on this, and maybe cell type or maybe disease subtype, whatever project we're interested in. And then we'll use some sort of computation um, to give us similar information. So uh, I'll give you a couple of the examples in a moment of using uh, Bayesian classifiers or artificial neural networks. So the goal is to try to reduce the burden on the pathologist um, and uh, develop infrared imaging to give uh, the same information or potentially more information. Okay, so this whole process actually involves many different elements. Uh, through to the theory, uh, instrumentation, we, we do a lot of work building novel infrared imaging instruments and Raman imaging instruments, uh, data analysis, sampling, uh, and uh, we have some posters tonight and tomorrow with uh, some examples of these. Okay, so I wanted to give you a couple of examples of what this can give you. Well, one of the things we, I've been working on is being able to histologically segment uh, breast tissue into its key components. So this particular study was uh, on eight components. So epithelial cells, a number of stromal components such as fibroblasts, cancer-activated fibroblasts, uh, pure collagen, uh, blood necrosis, lymphocytes, mucin. So the idea behind this is we take our infrared image, uh, I then take uh, multiple special immunostimulations, Things. And we design a training set to basically be able to predict uh, what the different cell types are in this unstained tissue. So the basis behind this is we'll build up our training set, we'll extract the chemistry from all the different components, these are the components here, and we basically data mine and try to find uh, features, spectral features, which are chemical features, which are predictive of what the component it is. So a nice example here is you see this big orange spectrum here. Uh, this is uh, mucin, so you tend to find that mucin is highly absorbing uh, at 1030, which is uh, glycogen, this is a glycoprotein. So what we do, I won't bore you with all the classification steps, but what we can do is we can mine into this and use this for predicting the components. Uh, and this works very, very well. We can uh, get an average area under the ROC curve of 0.92 in training, uh, 0.89 in validation. But essentially the take home message is we can get our infrared data cube take each pixel, run our classifier, it'll look for these metrics we've identified, and we'll segment it and predict what component it classifies to. So this is a really nice example here where to uh, identify all the different components in this tissue, you need to take five stains, you'd have to uh, sit down, you'd have to do a process of deduction for what's staining, what's not staining. What we can do is take our single unstained IR image, run the classifier, and it will color code everything according to what is there. So. <clears throat> You can see your cancer-activated fibroblasts and your fibroblasts in the middle and uh, epithelial cells in green. However, there's one big major limitation with this technology okay. um, is the spatial resolution. If you go out and purchase an FTR instrument, the maximum resolution you're going to get is about 5 by 5 microns, which is uh, uh, fine for everything I've just shown you, but there are certainly cell types and tissue components which are really important for diagnosis or just for looking at uh, disease progression, which you can't see with some examples here. So one of the things I've been working on during my post talk has been uh, advancing high resolution imaging approaches and applying these to tissue. So this is the sort of standard, uh, this is from prostate core that you'd get when I was doing my PhD a few years ago, about 10 by 10 micron. This has gone up to uh, about 6 by 6 micron. And now we have, uh, we've been working on something called ATR, which uh, gives us an increased resolution by higher NA. Uh, and this is now what we can get uh, using our specially designed instruments in our labs. And uh, Rohit has a poster tonight. Yep, uh, it'll tell you the theory behind the instrument and how it works. And we essentially published this in Nature Methods last year, where we could get these dramatic improvements in spatial resolutions by modifying our instruments. Uh, and this was the first ever time that this was shown uh, to be capable with a mid IR instrument and certainly on tissue. And this opened up a whole uh, host of new components for us. Uh, so this is an example here, this was published earlier this year, uh, where we can look at endothelial cells, we can chemically characterize them, uh, which simply weren't accessible before. Now this is really important because uh, this is a sort of conventional image, this is a high resolution image. Uh, you can see here, this is a, in a breast tissue, the dark regions here, the dark purple regions here, they are epithelial cells and they have uh, 
infiltrating intralobular stroma. This is really important to visualize for early breast cancer detection. Uh, using our conventional techniques, you can't do this. When you extract chemistry from these different components, so epithelial in green versus intralobular stroma in purple, you get a greater chemical contrast. And this is really important because this is exactly what drives our classifiers. Uh, so we're doing a lot of work to be able to do very, very accurate, uh, high resolution segmentation of all the different components that uh, we need. Okay, just to wrap up. Uh, one of the things that this does, so I've shown how we can accurately segment our tissue based on the infrared images. However, one of the problems is that uh, we're throwing away a lot of information. The staining is still very important. There's a lot of information to be derived from that. So I've been working with a Beckman fellow here, who's a computer scientist, on developing artificial neural networks to basically be able to replicate staining. So what we do is we take a visible image, this can be HD or trichrome, or whatever you want, and then we take our infrared image. We then overlay them very, very carefully. Cool. And we can uh, train the neural network to identify uh, contrast differences in the visible image to chemical differences in the infrared image. And essentially what this can do is we take our own sensation, run our classifier, and it'll predict how it'll stain. And this works really nicely. So you can see uh, this is our real HD on the right, and this is our digitally reconstructed IR, uh, HD on the left, oh, on the right, sorry. Uh, we can do this for large sets of tissues very fast. So what's really nice with this is because we're using uh, chemicals and not, uh, because we're using the inherent biochemistry and not stains, uh, we're not subject to some of the limitations with staining. So you can see here where many of you have seen this before, where the stain just doesn't reach the end of the tissue or something's gone wrong. Uh, because we're used to using the inherent biochemistry, this doesn't happen. Um, we've basically now coupled this with our new high resolution infrared imaging in our uh, lab. It's the only one in the world actually offline. Uh, and we can do really beautiful images. So we can reconstruct h &E images, uh, Mason's trichrome images, uh, even immunohistochemical stains. Uh, we've done this for a whole host of things like Mentin and uh, CK, CD31, P63. And what's really nice is this is just a single section. Um, so you can scan your tissue, click a button, and you can do all these different stains. And uh, if you have the stain, you have the IR image, you can basically construct. Uh, everything we've tried to construct so far has worked really well. So, before Sarah kicks me off, uh, what makes this a uh, good image, a uh, good modality? Uh, it's fast, it's potentially elevated, it's completely non destructive. Um, you can stain the tissue afterwards if you wish. Uh, from a clinical perspective, there's no expensive stains or antibodies, it's very fast. Um, importantly, it's amenable to, for quantification as well. Uh, for example, if you want to look at uh, inflammation, you can run a lymphocyte classifier, click a button, and it will give you a very accurate percentage of how much uh, lymphocytes are in your tissue. Uh, What's also very exciting is it can potentially provide new chemical information into disease progression. So something I haven't talked about today, but I'm looking at uh, the advancement of pre-diabetic and diabetic patients and transplant patients uh, and being able to look at glycation in a way that's not been uh, possible previously. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much. So I, I, as I said, we work in Roy Bargava's group. Um, we have five posters, so go and harass our questions. Uh, you can listen about skin and uh, prostate and the HD instrument and uh, Sarah's got the post on uh, tissue engineering and using infrared. So uh, thank you very much. That's a good question. So uh, you can detect all. Well, you can detect alpha helical be depleted. Uh, so one thing you can do if you're interested in protein uh, is do spectral deconvolution, and you can actually pull out all those different components. Uh, it's really, really important. It actually is often uh, very, very useful for diagnosis, certainly things like this. Uh, in regard to single proteins, uh, probably not, just because uh, it's more of a holistic protein level. Uh, if you're, so one thing we've been working on is looking at like ER positive versus ER negative breast cancer and PR. Um, early results look promising, uh, but there's issues with uh, epithelial heterogeneity. Um, you're not necessarily going to detect a single protein, but you'll detect the downstream effects. So if you're ER positive or ER negative, uh, there's a whole machinery which changes, and uh, that has quite dramatic chemical changes. So yeah, it's a work in progress. We had some really good results, but it's, it's not working as well in validation as we'd hope. So, watch the space. 
Could you tell us a little bit about your APR system? I mean, is this like uh, do you use a, sam a wet sample there, or uh, what material is APR? Yep, it's actually germanium crystal. Uh, it's a 500 by 500 micron germanium crystal. Um, the we actually do it on uh, just uh, dry tissue, so this is paraffin embedded, oh, well, deparaffinized tissue. Uh, you can do it on wet tissue. Uh, that's so typically mid infrared. You can't do uh, in vivo work as well as absorbing. Uh, absorbed in mid infrared. But if you do an ATR based approach, you can do uh, potentially do in vivo imaging. Um, yeah, so basically the, uh, it's, got, it's a high refractive index, so you have a higher NA and uh, you can then get high resolution too. So we get about a 1.56 by 1.56 micron uh, special resolution. Yep. Hi, it was a very nice talk. Thanks. So I, I just didn't quite understand. So this is an actual hyperspectral technique? Are you getting a, a pixel by pixel um, a spectrum? Or is it just kind of an image of the image? Uh, no, you get it's a hyperspectral image. You get all the images, all the chemical information. Yep. And so, and are you able to um, separate out? Like, is there usually a lot of overlap between uh, signals of you know different stains or things like that, or, or do you have to do deconvolution? Um, is in uh, spatial deconvolution or spectral? Uh, the spectral deconvolution. Uh, yes. Yeah, so we don't typically do uh, spectral deconvolution uh, for the for this point. Uh, we're not too interested in where it's coming from, from a uh, protein level, for example. Uh, the deconvolution's been interesting. Uh, it's been tricky. There's been a lot of sort of, uh, uh, it's primarily actually with protein people who are more interested in those out feel it could be depleted. Um, but no, we haven't done a lot of that. Um, I saw a presentation about six months ago and yeah, basically they give very different data depending on what deconvolution technique we use. So we've been looking at spatial deconvolution. Um, I don't think we've got posted on that today, but uh, spectral deconvolution, no, we haven't done a lot on. No, there's potentially a lot of information that you can do with things like derivatives, and that will give you some of that information as well. Thank you for your talk. Um, so I know that this work is um, sort of definitely advanced. We're replacing the, the time intensity and the, the cost for staying. Um, do you still require a human in the loop for the reading the pathology data and making the, the, the cancer diagnosis, or are you working on um, making your um, classification predicted for cancer screening? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and that's something we've been working very closely with pathologists with. Uh, I think, realistically, we're never going to replace the pathologist. It's just too complicated. Um, I think there's a lot of things we can do to help guide the pathologist towards the final decision. Um, certainly things like stains. You have a limited sample. You know, like, man, I really wish I could do a CK stain for you know uh, metastasis or whatever. Uh, this could be very useful, but I don't... We're a long way away from giving uh, diagnoses. I, I think it's, it's just too complex, I think. Uh, things like uh, sarcomas, I think we can have a big impact on. That's something I'm interested in in the future, where um, we can give sort of diagnosis of cell type of origin, and that will help. It will still need a pathologist. But yeah, no, that's, that's a good question, because I think a lot of what we're doing has to be useful to the pathologist. Uh, a lot of stuff where it's just not useful. Um, so do they want to classify, or do they want a stainless staining type approach? Or, so yeah, that's, that's still a work in progress. That's going to be very important though. Yeah.